Okay, um, let's, uh, let's start the uh, exciting afternoon session. Uh, I would like to start it on time. So the, uh, the first speaker is a Professor Manfred Lindner. Uh, his topic is neutrino properties, highlights of non-oscillation results. There's going to be another talk by Marco Zita afterwards about accelerator and reactor neutrinos, so he's going to cover oscillation physics and Subhabhatika Swami on the phenomenology theory in the future. So I stick to results which are existing now and I'll focus on results now. We'll not make statements about roadmaps, future projects, etc. and so on. And there's going to be also another talk tomorrow on the very high energy neutrino source. We'll leave that out and focus on the non-oscillation results. So, since I'm the first one, it's maybe also good to remind people about what neutrino physics is all about. There's this enormous set of vastly different sources where we get neutrinos, from cosmology to lab-based sources, artificial sources. So there's the sun, there's astronomy like supernova, cosmology makes neutrinos, reactors make artificial antineutrinos, the atmosphere, Accelerators, the Earth is an, a source for geoneutrinos. There's all these different, vastly different energies, which implies there's vastly different methods for detection involved. There's vastly different uh, methods involved how to extract the signal. And of course, it also means that you should look at the particle physics from a neutrino perspective, not only through a beam pipe, but really in a, in a broader sense. And if you build some big project in any one of those, you should always be aware that some other method from some other source might do better things on a shorter time scale. It also shows that there's interesting physics for the sources behind this. I won't touch this, so for every one of those, the neutrinos are a unique source to look into the systems. So it's a very rich field, and that's what kept many of us uh, excited over the years. From a theory perspective, neutrinos are massive, and that's new physics. That is not part of the classical textbook standard model. And the simplest way to accommodate that is just to assume three right-handed singlets, it's an addition, it's not much, but it's an addition, it's an assumption. There could be more than three, there could be other states, etc. But if you assume these neutrinos, then of course you have the usual Dirac like Yukawa couplings, like for quarks and charged leptons. But then you get, in addition, for the first time, new structure. And then you get these Majorana mass terms, which are new, which are only there for only possible for singlet states. And you get new features, you get lepton number violation, which is not a change in the global symmetries. And with the Majorana masses, you get extra scales. The standard model has only one scale, the electric wave. Now, by the addition of Majorana mass terms, it's a multi-scale theory. It's quite a change, actually, in terms of concepts. So that's why I call this the standard model plus. And that then leads to the usual famous seesaw mass relation, which you can write in this block form, and which you diagonalize to give you heavy states of order MR and the light states of order MD squared over MR. That's usually said to be one of the arguments why neutrinos are especially light. But don't forget, this is our, our assumptions. All we have is some delta m squared from oscillations. And you can, of course, do different things. You can add scalar triplets or Fermi singlets or triplets and make neutrino masses in the way which is shown here. You can also go on and talk, have both things. You can talk the so-called higher dimensional operator language. You can have radiative neutrino mass generation. You can talk about SUSY and extra dimensions. There's a zillion ways out there how to explain these neutrino masses. And by no means we have demonstrated that there's three right-hand neutrinos. There could be all sorts of new physics out there which is waiting to be discovered. We also know that neutrinos can solve some of the problems of the standard model. Leptogenesis is, to my mind, the best explanation of the binary symmetry of the universe. It works just without too much adjustments. And the other thing is that KV stellar neutrinos are actually an excellent warm dark matter candidate, and I'll come back to that later. So there's a sort of assumptions when we talk about neutrino ma mass, which is new physics, and that also shows in immediately that there are connections to LHC and lepton flavor violating physics, which you sometimes people forget and which may actually become important in, in ways which, which uh, might be interesting. So the fields where progress was made, one of the big fields was double beta decay. Since this community usually doesn't work on these things, I, I give you the, uh, the uh, remind you of the, of the logic behind it. There's this odd, odd, and even, even nuclei. And there's on the left side, you have the beta minus decays where uh, nuclei can come down, the right side beta plus decays. And there are special occasions like here for germanium 76, where in principle by quantum numbers the decay, decay the next neighbor is possible, but by energy it's forbidden because the state Rs in 76 is heavier. 
So the only way for germanium-76 to decay is to make two jumps, to jump over the barrier, and then to release this energy Q beta beta, which is 2039 kV for germanium. So del beta decay has uh, the following. There's two neutrons become two protons plus some state X. The charge of the state X is minus two, and the energy Q beta beta goes into the state X if the, st uh, if the mass of the state X is less, much less than a GeV. We can have this in a standard model. It's just two weak decays, where two W bosons are exchanged and two neutrinos are produced, so it's two neutrino double beta decay. And if you go beyond the standard model, then you have also the state X can be two electrons only. That's called neutrino star beta decay, which is lepton number violating. And then, of course, you have different options. Either you can have lepton number violation by a Maharana mass, which I just wrote down, or there could be some other delta L equals two violating physics that shows up the first time in this process. So it's by no means guaranteed that this is a neutrino mass. It could be something else. Then the logic goes as following. You have the two neutrino double beta decay, and here the neutrino double beta decay, and the neutrino double beta decay is in, in all cases beyond the standard model physics, and don't forget that there's other cases there, there might be some other physics, not only neutrino masses contributing. The logic is simple, this is a four-body decay, so the spectrum looks continuous, while this is a two, uh, two, two, the two electrons coming out is a line, so you look for this two neutrino double beta decay signal, and then look for the zero neutrino double beta signal as a line, and you need a large amount of nuclei and extreme low backgrounds to be able to pull this line out. And that's the real challenge in these experiments. Then, for the particle physics side, once you talk about neutrino masses, the process is proportional to this quantity MEE, the effective neutrino mass, which is given in fundamental quantities in mixings and delta M squared and mass scale like this. The best way to visualize is this complex plane here, where the three contributions are like three sticks with a length that's known by the different delta M squared. The overall scale is the mass, that overall mass of neutrinos that we don't know, and the joints are the unknown complex CP phases. So it's like three sticks which you can pull apart and push together and find out what the shortest and longest distance is. And that explains this usual plot down there. If you go to a large mass scale and push things apart, there's this linear relation between what's left and what can be possible. If you push the ends together, then you can have, in the case of negative delta m squared, you cannot get shorter than here. In the case of positive delta m squared, you can push the ends together even though the sticks have final length. So if you're unlucky, then even though there's final, all these final parameters here, there would be no effect whatsoever. So then when you measure or look for double beta decay, you get limits on this MEE, and then you translate it in, in the fundamental parameters. That's the usual way to go. Then the question is which isotope? It's obvious that you have to go to large detector mass, and that of course means you have to look for what's the natural abundance of the isotope or enrich them, which is cost. You have to look at the detection technology, cost and feasibility, because not everything that you want may be uh, cost-wise uh, cost affordable or maybe feasible. Radio purity is a big issue. You have to go to extremely clean environments in order to be able to pull this very minute signal out. So that's why people usually like high Q beta beta, because going to high Q beta beta means there's less natural backgrounds to begin with. That's why the isotopes on the upper end are usually better than the ones down there where there's much more lines. Just to give you a feeling, we are looking nowadays in modern experiments for rates which are one decay per year and kilogram. To compare with your body in, your per, in a normal person at about 3,000 decays per person per second. That's just the order of magnitude that you have to uh, keep in mind which means that they have to do extremely careful material selection, screening the art and technology to get such clean materials, build these detectors and run them, not to get blinded by anything else that's out there. You want good energy resolution because if you have a wide energy window, you essentially see everything that's happening in this energy window. You can distinguish any background line that's in the interval. So if you have a very short energy, a uh, very narrow energy regime, you can say, is there anything or not? And they don't care about things outside. So it's the region of interest that's the QBD beta plus minus delta E, which is important. And then, of course, in the end, there's this nuclear matrix elements in order to translate the lifetime to the uh, particle physics process as the overlap of the wave function, which means there's an inherent uncertainty in the matrix elements of the order of one point something or two, which you have to fight and which is a non perturbative theory aspect. And, and then at the end of the day, when you put all this together, there's different solutions. Now, how to go? 
you have to think of the sensitivity for, let's say, the neutrino mass. In the first and optimal case, you can think of it without background. Then the number of events that you observe goes with these numbers here, with these numbers which are numbers of your material, but then with the mass times the exposure times divided by the half-life. That's the ideal world. If you invert it, then m beta beta is sensitive to 1 over squared mt. m is the mass of your detector, of your isotopes, and t is the measurement time. And then it scales like this, and you could immediately say, why don't you go to these isotopes because you're down there? That's where technology and, and other questions comes in. Because once you talk about backgrounds and things change, with background, you add now these background events, the sensitivity to m beta beta scales like the fourth root over c times delta e over mt. c is the background index that counts per kV per kilogram a year, how clean your material is in the, in the, in the interval where I observe, and delta E is the reach of interest where you, uh, it's essentially your energy, energy resolution. So very good sensitivity because at some point you hit the bound here, it requires large masses, large measurement times, small C, a very clean material, and the best possible energy resolution. So it's not enough to go to large masses if your energy resolution doesn't go along with that. So you think usually by going to higher masses to ton scale you win, but it doesn't, you don't win if you go down in the background index in a correlated way. This is shown in by these red lines for different C times delta E. If you, for example, took something like these isotopes here, but were in the background dominated regime, you would not be on this line, but would be in the red line and move with your mass like the fourth root up there. While if you take germanium, for example, and can stay in the background free regime, you move down here, and you can have a situation where with less exposure, much less exposure, you get more sensitive than the large detector, which is less clean and has uh, not, a, not as good as an energy resolution. So that explains the strategy of these experiments and also how they go. The first one where there is a result is the Gerda experiment, which is this collaboration here, which built a detector based on germanium with a good energy resolution. There's germanium diodes in the middle. Then there's all this effort on background reduction, very careful selection of materials, screening, etc. very sophisticated shielding. You go underground, you build VITA systems, you uh, operate in liquid argon in order to shield, and you use naked germanium detectors in order to avoid backgrounds and surfaces, etc. You use the source, source equals detector concepts in order to avoid extra material that you have to add to, to which again induces uh, radioactivity, and use pulse ship analysis in order to further suppress the backgrounds to distinguish signal events from background events. Just to give you a feeling, because this community doesn't know it, you have to do gamma and radon screening for every little screw that you put in the detector. So you, you really select materials with levels down to 10 microbacterial per kilogram. You uh, go for a radon emanation because radon emanates out of virtually any material, and radon 2 to 2 makes an alpha decay. If it diffuses in your detector or goes to the surface and does decay, it looks very much like what you're looking for. So you have to avoid radon that's emanating out there. So you also select material by uh, looking for radon emanation. And you can do ICPMS and other methods to beat down these backgrounds to get a very clean detector. Then you have to take the diodes. In Gerda, there are, we have two different types of diodes. The first one is the old Heidelberg, Moscow, and IJX detectors, so-called coax detectors. And, and there's a new type of detector called BG. And the difference, essentially, is the pulse shape ability. If you look at the pulse that's generated by a, uh, by the beta decay and by other events that you can distinguish, and there's a different behavior in terms of these pulse ships, and that's why these detectors are so, 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 so important. Then the blinding procedure is as follows. You blind the data because you're going for low statistics experiments, and once you open the data, there's no choice anymore. You define everything beforehand. So all the pro data processing details are fixed before on blinding. You, you publish that, and then you start data taking, and that started in January 2012, and then you keep the interesting region point, look at some point at the sidebands to see if you understand your backgrounds, collect data, and this was in this case 21.6 kilogram years, and at some point you open up and do your blinding and see what you get. The energy resolution in the case of germanium, as I told, is very good, so that's a very efficient way to get uh, good sensitivity. What is the result? That's what you see. This is the, uh, the, the energy regime, which is interesting. You see in, in gray the events after pulse shape discrimination. The, the open boxes are without pulse shape discrimination. You can see how pulse shape discrimination beats down the number of events. This is where QB the beta sits. And the question, is there a line on top of the background here? That's the question. In fact, you can see what that you understand things. The background is flat here. That's as expected from the background models consistently. And then you see from the background model, you expect 5.1 events without pulse shape discrimination and 2.5 events with pulse shape discrimination. And you open up the box and find there's essentially nothing, 
which means there's only seven events without and three events with pulse-shaped discrimination. That's the result, and then you transform it in a profile like it analysis in a, in a statement. You say you've, what you see in this regime is interpreted by a, a times a flat background signal plus B times a line. You fit the coefficients, and the best fit is actually no excess, which means there's a new upper limit uh, on, on the, uh, on, on the, on the half-life of the beta decay from germanium. That's as it goes. The next result comes to the extra calibration. This is what, what it is. They use a, a cylindrical liquid seen on TPC, so it's a different detec detection technology, but get, again, it's a low background experiment. They have also a lot of effort to get the radio purity down. There's some similarities and differences, I won't discuss it. And then at the end of the day, they have this liquefied uh, enriched xenon in the detector with a Q beta beta that's a bit higher. And then they classify the events they see in single site events and multi site events, called beta decay events or single site events, so you can use this also to reject backgrounds. And what they see is the new result. They see this spectrum here, and they, it, it looks very, very nice. The region of interest is uh, this beta beta. The energy resolution is 75.2 kV, so the energy resolution is less, which means they integrate more in, a certain, in their interval. And that's what they have to, to live with. And then you can see, first of all, that the data fit very well to the background plus a two neutrino uh, decay signal. This is a gray, gray stuff here. Then you can, from this uh, fit, you can first of all extract the new best value of uh, the 2 neutrino double beta decay of, uh, of xenon 136, which is down here. And then you can go in the reach of interest, this is this red interval here, and see if there's an excess that's attributed to a neutrino less double beta decay. That's here the blow up. That's the region of interest, and that's again what, what they do. They expect in the, from the background in this interval 31.1 plus minus 1.8 plus minus 3.3 events. They see 39 events, which is about one point sigma above uh, what expected, so they get a limit, and the limit is here. It's 1.1 times 10 to the 25 years at 90% confidence level, which, depending on the matrix element, translates in a uh, M beta beta between 190 and 450 MeV. That's from EXO. The other result that's due is from Kamlan Zen. Kamlan Zen is the collaboration here. It's based on Kamlan, which is a working detector. And that's actually the advantage of Kamlan Zen that they start off with a detector that's there, that's clean, existing. And the idea was to take this balloon inside here and to load it with, with xenon, the xenon 136, the double beta element, and then use the Kamlan detector to go after double beta decay. So that's what they do. That's the energy resolution, which translates in this region of interest, plus the energy resolution. Again, it's worse than germanium, so you integrate more, so you need more mass to compensate, and they have, of course, more mass. That's what they observed in their phase one. They clearly see the two neutrino double beta decay and also extract the, the, the half-life for that. And then there was a little surprise. They found here in the reach of interest lines which were not supposed to be there. For example, 110 silver, which actually is a fallout product of Fukushima in the end of the day. So that's understood. Actually, this silver is, was decaying as a half-life of 249 days, etc. But this, so say, was limiting phase one a little bit their ability. That's why they improved after phase one. Or phase one. They removed the radioactive impurities in the uh, liquid scintillator purification. They increased the amount of xenon by going to a higher concentration. And they did a spallation cut after a muon and also optimized the, uh, the volume selection so that they get better and, and uh, improved on, several, on several, uh, several steps. What they find in the end is shown here. They have a, 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 an improved uh, limit for the two neutrino half-life of C136, which is shown here from the seeing again this very prominent shoulder. And by looking in the reach of interest and zooming in, they can uh, fit the neutrino less double beta decay spectrum shown here on the right side and get to a limit that's, uh, that's uh, uh, shown here. It's a 2.6 times 10 to 25 years at 90% confidence level. So this is all in, in recent times. There's good improvement on double beta decay. And if you combine it, that's done here, you can draw the half-life of xenon versus the half-life of germanium. This is, so say, the, this is the Gerda phase one result. This is combined with pre-existing other germanium results, uh, limits, this is uh, Exo and Kamlan Zen. And then you can see uh, this is yellow band is the claim which was out there by the uh, uh, so-called KK clan that was out there for many years for a signal. And now if you combine all that, this signal is ruled out, it's, it's, a, it's a limit in the end. Now which one is, which measurement is better in the end? That depends on your matrix elements. Shown here are ratios of matrix to nuclear matrix elements, which are supposed to be more stable than the individual matrix elements. But still, depending on who calculates this ratio, you get a certain spread of numbers. 
It doesn't mean that there's a one sigma error bar on the theory side. It just means that at best, one of these lines is the correct ratio because all of these calculations make some assumptions, gives you a feeling for how well we understand the ratio of matrix elements. That's it. Now, depending if you go on the upper or lower side, you get strong limits either from germanium or xenon. Of course, you can combine it with, with that assumptions and get a combined best limit, which depends on, on, your, on your choice. So, but that's the situation now. The bounds for diabetes decay are moving, and that's good. And of course, the detectors go on and take more data and will become more, uh, more, more, uh, more sensitive as time goes by. There's also the NEMO experiment, which is interesting because it's uh, working quite differently. It's a unique tracking colorimeter, which has about 10 kilograms of sources in foils. This is this kind of detector. This shows the different isotopes there, and uh, it's mostly molybdenum. They get this limit for the half-life uh, for double, double beta decay here. Then the effective neutrino mass, there's this reminder that the assumption is that it's no other delta L equals 2 physics. Let me remind you that this may be wrong. This is uh, the two neutrino double beta decays, just two W bosons. This is your neutrino mass, my runner mass, which makes double beta decay. But if there were other new physics that violates the number by two units, you can easily draw such diagrams here. Then, of course, you would also contribute, and you don't know when you see a signal what's there. And if you put a limit, you actually limit everything. And of course, it shows that this has connections to LHC physics because as a rule of thumb, a sub-electron volt sensitivity of Majorana mass corresponds to roughly to TV scale particles being exchanged here. So it could be that new TV physics actually shows up in such experiments uh, for the first time and that there might be some synergetic pro, uh, synergy with LHC and lepton flavor violating physics. Just to show you, there you can also draw diagrams where I take the Dalbita decay and other diagrams. It's Feynman diagrams, so you have to add them and square them so you get actually interferences. And then you can actually have a distortion when you take the same triangle as before. You can add now some other physics and get this kind of distortions. Even the extraction of the neutrino parameters is quite changed a lot. It shows that there is some assumptions which affect how you interpret the data. And that's interesting to be watched. Now, the most boring case is just by runner masses, and then still it's, it's interesting physics. I have only a, f uh, a few minutes left, but there's more physics to say. I want to spend the rest of the time on neutrino mass and properties from cosmology. We all have seen this very spectacular CMB maps from WMAP and Planck. They can be uh, put in this kind of charts where you show the uh, power spectrum as a function of the multiple L. And it's a huge success of the lambda CDM model with three active neutrinos included, and with a sum of neutrino masses, which is from oscillations larger than 0.06 electron volt in kilometers. But of course, it also means if you distort the sum of neutrino masses, or if you change the number of effective neutrinos too drastically, it will show up in this kind of fits that you would know. You have to be a little bit careful when you do this kind of uh, fits, because all together there's something like of the order of 40 parameters, and you should do a global fit and not fix some of the parameters and fit the other ones so because there are degenerates in the parameter space. So that's why we have to, one has to be careful. Effects of the N effective and the, and the sum of the neutrino mass. The N effective essentially counts the massless degree of freedom beyond photons, which are relativistic during the radiation dominated area. And usually this is about three. And of course, the effect of the, this is on the damping tail. So if you have extra degrees of freedom, for example, the fourth neutrino, it shows up in the change in the tail over here. Then if you combine data, and because of time, I have to be short now, you can now, that's what you also see out there, combine different things. You can combine Planck and W map and high L data and get this kind of limit. You can add lensing, or you can also add then barrier and acoustic oscillations. Depending on what you add up, you get different bounds. And they're all in the ballpark of 0.2 to 0.6 or so electron volt. And it shows that it, yeah, it also depends on what you trust and what you distrust in this kind of exercise. This is an interesting version. This is a slide shown by uh, Marta Spinelli at the neutrino conference. It shows how the sum of neutrino masses is affected by these kind of things. And I point you to this red line here, which is the, the, uh, the Planck alone data. And it says it gives artificially low results. And the point is that the, it pushes to a negative sum of neutrino masses. So you have to be careful that it's a difference if you take the sum of neutrino masses as a fit parameter, which also can be negative, or if you call it a physical sum of neutrino masses, which should not be negative. And of course, this affects what the numbers are. So it just shows you this, how I call it, murkiness of the exact limits that you get from these kind of combinations. In the end of the day, by experts will say what you get this day, the effective neutrino mass numbers is 3.32 plus 0.27 at 68% uh, confidence level, and the sum of neutrino masses is, is claimed to be less than 0.28 electron volts. 
just quickly, I skipped that. There's also limits on an effect from BBN. The numbers are here. You get something at three point something plus uh, plus plus minus uh, 0.3 or so. There's some tension between the Hubble constant and and uh, CMB plus BO, uh, uh, by oscillation, and you can relax that, and then you get something at 3.62 plus minus 20, 0.5. Then people say this excludes an extra stellar neutrino. I would say, well, be careful. This is one sigma. So how many sigma would it take? And uh, there is some dependence on what you do. So be careful. I think an extra stellar neutrino so would not really be excluded by that. If it would be found, people would find a way to accommodate it. Last thing, and I'm done in, within a minute, neutrino stars matter. We know that active neutrinos are excluded. They're hot, they're too light, and they, but they make 0.3% of the universe. But there's something else. If a KV star neutrino existed, it would be an excellent warm dark matter candidate. We know that right on neutrinos most likely probably exist anyway to explain neutrino masses. You only need some theoretical scenario to make one of these usual, of these heavy states light. So it's a theory discussion what you have to do to get one of the states light. Once you have that, then the decay of the heavy neutrinos can actually populate this here, which is your dark matter candidate, and you can also do leptogenesis at the same time. It's so minimalistic that it's shocking how little you need to solve the dark matter and barren symmetry of the universe problem with this scenario. And that's also something that has recently received some attention because uh, a KV star neutrino would be seen by a, a gamma line in, in, the, in the KV, a red half of the mass, and there's observational limits, which are shown here. There's this regime which is left over, and uh, there's only tiny mixings which are allowed, but this is natural because it's the active star mixing, which is supposed to be tiny from the scale ratios. That's the situation, and there was recently claims that there is a gamma line at these, at these energies in a few KV, which would translate into masses of order seven KV or so, I'm not sure if I, I believe it, but there's a heavy debate going on what this means, and I think this should be watched. It just shows how little other experiments suddenly can change the landscape of neutrino physics and dark matter. And the end of the day, this point would be sitting just right here and uh, would uh, fit in where it goes. But as I said, I'm skeptically, so one has to discuss further the reliability of the signal. It's an ongoing discussion, and I think it's far away from claiming anything, but it shows, as I said, how things could change by some uh, little astro. Uh, uh, particle physics experiment as opposed to building huge detectors that are in 20 years and look for something else which you believe might be there. Let me summarize because my chairman is getting nervous. Neutrino physics was and is a hot field. There's diverse, div diverse sources in the laboratory in astrophysics and cosmology. There's various, various new non-oscillation results and I presented you uh, focused on the new limits on double beta decay and uh, pointed out that this has connections to other lepton number violating physics, which connects to LHC and lepton flavor violating physics. I was apprehended briefly the number of neutrinos and the neutrino mass sums from cosmology. I gave this KV neutrino discussion as an example how neutrino physics might mix up things in a, in a spectacular way. There's many other topics which you cannot cover in this time, and there's the oscillation physics and theory which is going to be covered in the next talks. Let me summarize or conclude by saying neutrinos had surprises, and I would say there is a lot of extra potential for new surprises, so stay, stay tuned. This field is going to produce much more and interesting results. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice summary. Um, this presentation is an open for comments or questions. Let's see. It was so clear. I was happy. I don't see any hands. All right. Well, then uh, let's thank the speaker one more time. <laughs>